A routine early morning walk for one man, but this day would be unlike others. His dog would not only uncover a skull, but a past that one killer thought he buried forever. Here we had a person who was sticking his thumbs up at society and saying, I've got away with this. The system's about to take him on. I wasn't sure whether he'd gone overseas, gone underground, or just didn't want to be found. We only get one go at forensics. We can't go back and put bodies back and redig them. Having everything intact, then getting an X-ray, meant it was almost like X-raying a living person. He was uh, making allegations even at that stage that it was a police setup. It looked like something from a movie. The skull, Ed's head, had a really long, thin face. I thought this could be Harvey. He thought he'd go away with it. Cold. He thought he'd be right. And uh, it was going to be a fight to the end. When a human skull was found on this beach, there was little doubt the victim had been murdered. But it was what happened six months before that discovery that would be vital in solving this case. The killer had boasted that even if police found his victim, they would never prove he was the murderer. But these were no bare bones. Botany Bay was a crime scene today after a human skull was found buried in a sandbank. A man walking his dog made the grim discovery. He was quite taken aback, rather shocked, and uh, he, uh, he went home to, to settle down with a cup of tea, I think. It was rather unexpected on a Sunday morning. While the victim's identity remains a mystery, police here have called in Task Force Snowy, the special team of detectives investigating a series of gangland murders dating back to the 80s. <laughs> What we had here was a crime scene. And we all know from experience that crime scenes leave clues. The trick is to find the clues. So we had to, one, get the remains out, and secondly, preserve any forensic capacity that was there. With an encroaching tide later that day, we knew we were on time limits. The tide had already uncovered the top of his skull. So it may undermine the area where we had to dig. And I spoke to Lyle at the scene and said, I think we need to put some form of protection in so that we weren't going to lose what could have been vital information and vital evidence. With the tide coming so close to the skull, the skull could well have been washed away. So we built a sandbag area around the skeleton and backfilled the entire area with sifted sand to stabilise the skull because we only get one go at forensics. We can't go back and put bodies back and redig them. It is absolutely imperative that everything is addressed first time round. Task Force Snowy had recently received a tip off that a particular murder victim from the 1980s had been buried in this very spot. There may have been fired cartridge cases in their projectiles. Um, any of the ID from the deceased, like a wallet or anything else that may have been discarded by the murderers, uh, the firearm itself. So we had to make sure that we didn't miss any of that evidence. The skeleton is approximately five feet below the surface of the soil of the embankment. Currently, members of the rescue squad and a backhoe operator are removing the vegetation on top of where the skeleton is located. The backhoe operator removed all the sand from the top of the body and when we got to a level where we believed that we should start digging by hand, there was still a large amount of sand there so we got him to use the backhoe scoop and he started scooping away and unfortunately the first scoop of sand, out came this brown tan shoe hooked on the, the fork of the backhoe. Well, I was not happy about that. Yeah, when they hooked onto his shoe, <laughs> I thought, oh no, they might have ripped him about a bit. Obviously we um, stopped digging at that stage 
and from there on in we went down very slowly by hand. It's now 5.20pm. We've removed the overburden to the level of the sandbags that we established earlier on today. These three blue arrows here indicate the location of the skeletal head, approximately here. We'll continue digging down until we uncover the remains. The closer we got to the body, the smaller the implements we started using. We eventually ended up using paintbrushes and spoons to actually dig the sand away from the remains so as not to damage them. It looked like something from a movie, but here we were dealing with it in real life. We were able to um, dig down underneath the body. There was a bit of a seal between the remains and the sand, and we broke that seal by two police officers tying a piece of string to their hands and just moving it down underneath the body. So once that had occurred, we then uh, positioned a bodyboard under those remains. I was very worried when we started sliding that spinal board under there because things started moving, <laughs> sand started crumbling, and I thought, this, this is not going to work. But the more we persevered, the better it came together, and it did actually work. We were then able to lift it up and place it into a body bag and uh, head it down to the mortuary. At that stage, um, all we had um, as skeletal remains, partially dressed in some uh, clothing, uh, full stop. But these bones would tell a story. Within the skeleton were clues to its identity and that of the killer. When a skull was found buried deep within a sand dune, a special task force of detectives were called into the site by the local police. There were a number of police there, including one of the botany detectives. He said, oh, we found one of your bodies. I said, oh, that's great, mate, which one? This area was considered a dumping ground for gangland murders of the 80s, and this may be one of its victims. He took me over and showed me the skull, and this skull, dead set, had a really long, thin face, and I thought, this could be Harvey, and I don't want this to sound derogatory, but having known Harvey, he had a very thin, long face. Harvey Jones was a minor criminal. He was um, a glorified thief. He was a would-be gangster. He was well-dressed, well-turned out, uh, dripping in gold. He was a mug there, and uh, he was as flash as a rat with a gold teeth. He went missing. His mother was very upset. His sisters were very upset. There was a very basic investigation done by police at the time, because of the people he mixed with. Uh, wasn't sure whether he'd gone overseas, gone underground, moved into state, or just didn't want to be found. We needed a positive identification of the human remain. So it was OK for us to suppose that it was Harvey Jones, but we had to prove it to a coroner. And we also had to prove that he was murdered. Given the nature of the case where police suspected foul play, it was very important to examine the body in its entirety and to be as comprehensive as possible. So literally, you want to have as much material as, as you can. The first thing that was done was to take an X-ray of the remains, obviously to find anything which might be inside which would be of interest. The X-rays showed tiny fragments of foreign material that was consistent with the outside casing of a fired projectile. And the two projectiles that we recovered were quite deteriorated, but nevertheless, they were consistent with having been fired into that body. The suspicion that the victim had been shot was right on the money, but whether it was Harvey Jones or another gunshot victim was still up in the air. There was no fingerprints or DNA available. But what had weathered the years was the dead man's clothing, still hanging on his skeleton. It was amazing to see how much of the clothing was still intact. 
the cardigan was still there. You could clearly see the side seams of where the jeans had been. The buttons still had all their markings on them. The cardigan was one of those ones that had the leather patches on it. And you could see where the leather patches had been. The nylon fabrics, the interfacing and lining of the cardigan was 100% intact. It could almost move the zipper on it. One of the things that had been reported when Harvey went missing in 1983 that he was wearing a particular brand shirt, Fuss, F-U-S. And that shirt had been obtained from overseas in a place called Guitar and had been sent to him by his sister. But that by itself was not conclusive. Clothing per se is unreliable. People can change clothing and there's always more than one shirt in existence, so it's not conclusive. We needed to go much further than that. Well, we thought we'd identify him by dental records to start with, so we went along to the dentist and said, you know, have you got the records of Harvey? And they said, oh, no, he was seen here seven years and one week away when we've destroyed the records because you've only got to keep them st by statute for seven years. So I said to the detectives, we could carry out this video superimposition. So we've just got that centred now, that ball joint centred around where his front teeth are because they showed me a photograph and it had teeth in it, smiling teeth. So we've got something to actually match up because we had the teeth on the skull and the teeth on the photograph. Head down a bit more, head down, head down, head down. Yeah, that's getting close coming in. That'll be very close now. So you can use two television cameras to overlay the teeth from the photograph to the teeth on the skull. Now we're overlaying the premolars to start with, then across to this canine with this very unusual worn off canine, with the next tooth to with the lateral tooth, which is usually a lot smaller, and then coming across to these front teeth with a V chip in, the, in them, and then across to the lateral on the other side. Then you can look for the rest of the skull for outline of soft tissue to see if it matches. Looking at the, from the right side to the left side, the outline of the orbit, the eye position, and coming across to the left-hand side, you're looking at the bony outline, you can see on the soft tissue relative to the bone where that large lump of bone is above the eye. And as they crossed, it, it just jumped out of you. It was Harvey. It was quite disconcerting. Slightly creepy. A bit like a horror movie where the face melts away and you've got the skull left. It was like Harvey's face had jumped out of the skull at you. At that point, we had the first positive identification that would stand scrutiny in any form, in any court, that the person that we dug up was Harvey Jones. But who had killed the 29-year-old man 12 years before? The task force was in possession of other vital evidence, evidence that would put them hot on the heels of the killer. 29-year-old Harvey Jones had vanished in 1983. His clothed skeleton was found 12 years later. Its identity only confirmed through one photo that had survived over the years. It was quite a wonderful photograph. It was um, of, of some individuals having lunch, and there was the, the lobster in front of them, the glass of Chardonnay. A fairly bulky bloke on one side, and Harvey Jones on the other side. That bulky bloke linking arms with Harvey was his best mate. Nettie Smith, who was one of the most well-known and feared criminals in the 1980s. Nettie was a career criminal, a long history of convictions for thieving, assaults, robberies, armed robberies. A large man, physically overpowering. The only way you'd hold him down would be with a piece of 4 by 2 around the ears. He was a very violent character, um, very mean, um, just a vile creature. But he had some powerful friends. According to him, he was uh, involved in large-scale police corruption. He was given a green light to um, uh, commit armed robberies, to be involved in drugs. The bloke was effectively bulletproof. He could do what he wanted in this town, anything. Smith has repeatedly and very publicly said he was provided with police assistance to the point of being dropped off and picked up from armed robberies in marked cars and being provided with police equipment and uniforms to conduct armed robberies. So a fairly significant relationship. And one that Harvey Jones admired. Harvey Jones idolised Nettie Smith and just wanted to be as um, 
infamous as uh, what he was. Harvey Jones is a very small time player on this scene. Uh, he earned his living managing a brothel at Homebush. He was a used car salesman at another point. A uh, loud mouth, tall gangly fellow who nonetheless seemed to throw his weight around in pubs, uh, had propensities to wearing loud fake jewellery, thought he was, you know, he was hanging around with um, the man of the moment and would be seen to be a serious gangster if he's able to go out drinking with Nettie Smith and Ned would give him the time of day. But he doesn't seem to have really added much to, to Smith's business or would have caused him anything other than trouble. Harvey had been charged with some thefts of some gold bullion. There was a court case pending. And he had been assembling the money, he said, to bribe police to have those charges fixed. And according to Nettie Smith in one of his autobiographies, finding the money wasn't going to be difficult for Harvey and Nettie would help him with the exchange. But only 24 hours before the deal was to be done, Harvey was making himself unpopular. He was involved in an incident at Sheila's nightclub at North Sydney. He had a habit of uh, going to nightclubs, pulling out his revolver, letting one go on the roof to uh, the horror of the patrons. That caused uh, police inquiries and it brought some unwanted attention to, uh, to him and also to the people he was actually hanging around with. The next night, July 15th, 1983, Harvey Jones was to make the $60,000 payment in return for his charges being dropped. He told his mother that he was going to see Nettie Smith that night for a meeting, according to her, and that was the last time that she had seen him. But in his book, Nettie claims Harvey never turned up, and after waiting for hours, he called Mrs Jones, wondering where her son was. Smith was recorded a few days later saying that he contacted Harvey's mother and was concerned about his, his welfare. Nobody uh, had seen him or heard of him or heard what happened to him. It was just one of those sort of dead investigations. But um, other than people who knew him directly and noticed his absence, uh, Harvey Jones disappearing off the face of the planet wasn't going to cause a great deal of um, public concern. But over the next few years, disappearances and underworld murders would literally be in the public arena. Sydney police are hunting the underworld assassins of 49-year-old Barry Croft. The shooting happened just before 7 o'clock in the midst of late night shops. There's many areas he could have been taken, but the underworld liked to do it in the, in the open streets. Barry McCann's bullet riddled body was discovered at 6.30 this morning by a council cleaner. This was a professional hit. Police have found more than 20 spent cartridges. The body of Sally Ann Huxtep was fished out of a pond at Centennial Park today. Michael Daniel Chubb had just returned from buying fish and chips for lunch when the killer struck. By the time that the shooting had stopped, there were perhaps a dozen fairly well-known crooks dead during this period. Uh, no one was charged for any of their murders. Nettie Smith, his name had been connected to some of these. Uh, but certainly other people's names had been connected to them as well. They were on the books as unsolved murders. In 1994, Task Force Snowy was on the scene. In their hands, they had secretly taped confessions about these murders. One of them was about Harvey Jones, and the voice on the tape was of the man he idolised, Nettie Smith. The underworld figure, Arthur Nettie Smith, has been sentenced to life for the murder of a stranger. A Supreme Court judge rejected Smith's claim that he'd been too drunk to know what he was doing. For a fellow who was perhaps this city's most notorious criminal ever, he has come unstuck through road rage. Nettie Smith was found to have stabbed Ronald Flavel in the stomach on Coogee Bay Road. The dispute broke out when a tow truck driver flicked his lights at a car Smith was travelling in. Today, Justice McInerney sentenced Smith to life in jail, adding to the 13-year sentence he's already serving for armed robbery. The crunch finally came and uh, he went to jail for life. But he was still eligible to apply for parole. That wouldn't have meant that he was going to get it, but he's still able to apply and, of course, anything could happen.
Nettie spent nearly three years alone in his cell here at Long Bay Prison. And during that time, he wrote a book, Nettie, The Life and Crimes of Nettie Smith, which became a bestseller. But as he started to pen his next, a book about the unsolved murders of the 80s, he had company. There was a little bit of overcrowding, and uh, by chance, another prisoner was placed in the same cell. They asked if I'd like to go on with someone I might have heard of through the media or who I might know through the prison system. And um, I asked them who it was, but they wouldn't tell me. So they led me up to the cell blocks and locked me in the cell up there, and, and then Nettie Smith walked in. He was pretty impressive, pretty large sort of a bloke, physically. He knows how to um, take up a room. But he had these eyes that just bored straight through you, like real cold, icy blue. Yeah, he's a one-off, that's for sure. Police would know this prisoner as Mr Brown. Mr Brown has spent most of his adult life um, in prison um, for thieving, assaults, drug abuse, alcohol abuse. Um, just one of those institutionalised persons who uh, survives in the jail environment. Well, there was only two of us in the unit, so you basically you had to talk to someone, so we ended up talking to each other and struck up a pretty good rapport with each other. And um, he was writing a book at the time, and he began telling me about some of the things he did that he could put into the book and some of the things he did that he couldn't put into the book. And some of those was about various murders, so, yeah. They are pretty brutal, pretty frank. Like, I've been in jail at that stage probably 20 years, and they scared me because I knew that they were true. That was probably more the, like, you hear a lot of stories in jail and you just put it down to bullshit, but um, with this bloke, he just knew. Then he started bragging to him about murders that he'd committed, and the informant was quite sickened by the way that Nettie would cold-bloodedly told him about these murders. He told me about um, a certain murder that he did and it gave me nightmares. And that's when I thought, well, you know, maybe this is a bit more than just being a crim in a jail. Maybe I should do something about it. So I contacted the police and the operation began. With the cooperation of Mr Brown, we were able to capture a lot of these conversations about all these unsolved murders going back many years on an authorised listening device tape. I lay awake many, many nights thinking about it, and thinking about the consequences and whether I'd be able to do it or not. And I couldn't find a reason not to. I think in total there was mention of 14 separate murders. Some of them were gangland related, some of them were drug rip-offs, and some of them were revenge killings. One of them was the murder of Harvey Jones. Mr. Brown ran a very high risk. One word out of place, Nettie was not stupid completely. Um, if it had said the wrong thing, well, he would have been in fairly grim straits. I was thinking, shit, I hope he doesn't hear the, the tape recorder. That's about all I was thinking. <laughs> um, yeah. But he persevered and um, he teased a lot of detail, a lot of information from Nettie. In a lot of ways, it seemed to me that the only reason that he killed Harvey was because Harvey annoyed him. I never met Harvey, but from what I did find out about him, it seemed that he was a bit of a, a party boy. He went over the top a few times, but. He certainly didn't deserve to pay for it with his life for no more than upsetting the bloke. But that's how things were back then. To use his words, he um, elsewhere in the book indicates that uh, most big type criminals come undone because of their mouth and uh, they tell too many people too many things. And here is he falling for the same trap. The tapes themselves would have allowed us to go out and charge Nettie forthwith, but that would have been uh, quite foolish to do it because uh, 
any brief that hinges on a confession per se, well, wouldn't get past first base. And you'd just be wasting your time. It'd be nothing worse than charging Nelly than watching him walk. What they needed was a body. And for months, they searched the area mentioned by Nettie on the tapes. I've flown over, I've driven over, I've walked through. I knew it better than I really wanted to. Um, but I didn't find Harvey Jones. Um, a man walking his dog found Harvey Jones. I was watching the news and it said how a bloke had been walking his dog along the beach at Botany and found human remains. And that was pretty much where Nettie said it was on the tape. And I said, oh, I, I bet you that's Harvey Jones. My first impressions was, well, uh, here's one brief for Ned. And Nettie had given them a challenge. Somewhere in um, those remains, hopefully, would uh, give us that linkage back to Nettie Smith and confirm what was on the tapes. He thought he'd go away with it, Carl. He thought he'd be right, for sure. Here we had a person who was sticking his thumbs up at society in general and saying, I've got away with this. And that was our challenge to make sure, well, you just can't do these things and get away with it. And that was our challenge then to make sure that we put him away and that he paid the price for what he's done. Police had secretly taped Nettie Smith in his jail cell, confessing to the murder of his friend, Harvey Jones. <laughs> <laughs> and was confident he'd got away with it. We had no doubts that Harvey Jones had been murdered by Nettie, but the, um, the standard of proof in the, the courts for charge of murder is extremely high, and it's beyond reasonable doubt, not just that you think it was him. Nettie, unfortunately, had been locked up for some time and didn't appreciate the value of forensics. He had been locked away. He felt that sense of security. A lot of time had elapsed. He would think that there'd be nothing to tie him back into the crime scene or the crime. The first step in the process was to establish whether the projectiles found at the post-mortem were fired from a 357 revolver, as Nettie had stated. There was not a lot of evidence presented to us ballistics-wise. Usually when we go to crime scenes, we'll have a body, we'll have fired cartridge cases, we'll have the smoking gun, so to speak. In this case, we had none of that, except the recovery of the two bullets, which were heavily corroded and badly damaged as well. If we recover a bullet under normal circumstances and it's in quite good condition, we will weigh the projectile, we'll measure the projectile, the diameter of it with calibers, We'll also look at those individual markings on the bullet, those lands and grooves, and we can do that by looking at it under a microscope, which will give us an indication of what type of firearm could possibly have been used. What we're looking at here is the surface of the bullet, the side view, and we're actually looking at one of the landmarks on the bullet to make an identification. The problem in this case was that we could only identify one partial landmark on each of the bullets. However, even though the examination was limited, we went to our reference material. Did some firing of some weapons out of our library and found the two bullets, both consistent with being fired from a 38 caliber 357 revolver. It was encouraging evidence, but the task force would need further proof. Neddy had claimed he had used the 357 and blew out Harvey's heart. The X-rays were very helpful and showed a number of fractures in ribs of the chest cavity, undoubtedly fractured by a gunshot. There were shards of projectile around the fracture line, indicating that uh, a projectile had entered the chest, probably from the front, in all likelihood striking the heart and or lungs. But even that wasn't enough for this team of detectives led by John Laycock. For them, it was a matter of crossing all T's and dotting all I's. I don't like just to put 
the bales on the top of the stumps. I like to build the stumps right in, so it was, there's no room for any movement. We're playing A grade here. This is a uh, first class crook, if I can use those terms, and uh, it was going to be a fight to the end. So we didn't want to leave anything open to any suggestion that uh, it wasn't so. It could be easily seen as a get square. They had to overcome that and therefore everything they did had to be very much above board. We were on the right track. We just had to keep on going uh, to really tighten the noose around his neck and give him no room to move. If you raced out, you'd muck it up and uh, you'd never forgive yourself if you walked. To further support our theory, we uh, sent one of Harvey's ribs down to an expert in Melbourne. What we needed to know was, was there any traces of lead on these ribs? I was basically asked by New South Wales Police to uh, have a look at uh, some bones. There was some visible damage to one of the rib bones and they wanted to know if this damage was caused due to a gunshot or some other form of damage that could have occurred while the body was buried in the sand. The damage was cone-shaped, which is very typical of bullet damage. But then there was obviously a matter of actually proving it, not just giving an opinion. To do that, the bone was put into a scanning electron microscope so that any particles on the rib could be detected and analysed. Various heavy metals show up as various images. Material that has a high atomic number basically shows up as a bright particle. So things like iron and lead, you get quite bright images. And lead has its own unique shape and form. A pattern is produced and that pattern corresponds to lead. In this case, both lead and calcium was detected. Uh, the calcium comes from the bones. So the material that was actually on the bones was in fact lead. The finding of lead on the bone and around the damage uh, confirms that a lead projectile, a, a bullet, uh, caused that damage. Even more damning evidence was found from the clothes Harvey was wearing on the night he was murdered. When I started examining the cardigan and the shirt, I had to distinguish between decay and forensic evidence. I located what I believe to be a projectile hole on the cardigan, midway up on the nylon section of the zipper. Now, the remainder of the zipper was totally intact by this one area. Harvey's shirt also had a distinctive hole. We were able to determine that the fabric had been doubled over when the projectile had been fired. When you overlay the two pieces of fabric, it becomes a perfectly circular hole. The holes were measured for diameter. Both the holes in the right chest area were consistent with being either a 38 calibre projectile or a 357 calibre projectile. The most crucial piece of forensic evidence that was obtained from the clothing was the fact that the holes in the jumper in the front right chest area matched the holes in the shirt in the right chest area and we were clearly able to establish a bullet trajectory from entering the cardigan through the shirt and actually striking a rib in Harvey's chest. We were on a winner. We're on a conviction. We knew it. The forensic case linking Nettie Smith to the murder of Harvey Jones was strong. Not only had the experts proven the skeleton in the Sandhills was Harvey, but they were able to prove that he had been shot and the weapon was most likely a 357 revolver. When those bullets exited the gun, they made a perfect and traceable trajectory through his cardigan and shirt, hitting a rib in his chest. Police now had the forensic evidence they needed to match the words used by Nettie in their secretly taped recordings. Also in the confession was the mention of a man who was with Nettie on the night Harvey was killed, a man who police would call Mr Green. He'd originally been spoken to by police and was uncooperative, however, when the body was found, it firmed up certain information that we'd been given, and he became cooperative with the police. Mr Green was a driver or a gopher for Nettie Smith in those years, and um, he told us the whole story. On 
the night of the 15th of July 1983, according to Mr Green, he went to the Star Hotel in Alexandra where he met Nettie and Harvey Jones. There was some discussion about Mr Green making some money that night. So they all got into a van and Nettie directed them to drive to the vicinity of Botany. They lied from the car and Nettie Smith and Harvey Jones went for a walk down on the beach. Mr Green stayed behind on Nettie's instructions to keep a lookout. A short time later, there was a gunshot and um, Harvey uh, had been shot by Nettie. down to the beach and he saw Harvey lying on the ground. Nettie was standing over the top of him with a gun in his hand. Mr Green was then directed by Nettie to dig a hole, which he did. There was a shovel obtained from the van. He dug a fairly deep hole and the body was placed into that hole. And they then left the scene and went back that night to the Star Hotel and just continued on business. Now, that by itself is pretty damning evidence, but um, it's a man's word and it's open to dispute. You'd probably have to look at possible motives and his background. So it's a question of how much weight you would place on it per se. But put together as a package with the tapes, the um, crime scene, the forensics, it certainly left no gap um, that Nettie could punch holes in when it got to court. So. It just helped tie everything together. Colourful Sydney identity Nettie Smith has appeared in court charged with murdering an underworld figure 15 years ago. Arthur Nettie Smith under tight security to face trial for the gangland killing of brothel owner Harvey Jones. It's 15 years to the day since he was executed with two gunshot wounds to the chest. He was then buried in sand dunes along Botany Bay. Police claim Smith lured Jones to the beach to get $60,000, allegedly to pay off corrupt detective Roger Rogerson for getting Jones off a criminal charge. His body was undiscovered for 13 years. Prosecutors say Smith confessed to the crime. He was secretly recorded boasting about how he got away with it. The defence counsel consented to those tapes being admitted into evidence without contest. So the only defence that Nettie would have was say I was um, boasting or uh, telling lies or what have you. His explanation in his words were, I'm talking crap. It's pretty accurate crap, someone that's talking crap. He was saying that he was testing Mr Brown, seeing if he told him this story he heard it back on the prison grapevine. And he says that did, in, in fact, happen. There's been a day of courtroom drama as alleged hitman Nettie Smith came face to face with a cellmate who informed on him. Looking back now, I think it, I think it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever done, but at the time it seemed very, very simple, very easy. I, I got nervous, you know, before court, just like anyone else, I suppose, and like talking in public and that. But, um... And probably because I was telling the truth in, in the court, see, so it didn't really matter that much. I, was, I just had to go and tell the truth, so I didn't have to worry about keeping stories together or anything like that. The trial that included evidence from Mr Brown and all the forensic experts lasted two months. Even with all the evidence and with our confidence, um, you can never estimate what a jury would or would not do. The jury was out for about three or four days, which was a very torturous process. Was there something we'd missed? Was there going to be a legal technicality to be thrown up by the jury and either a hung jury, which would involve a retrial, or, God forbid, to be acquitted? Sydney's most notorious gangster will spend the rest of his life in prison. Arthur Nettie Smith was found guilty of murder. He was first jailed for theft at the age of 15. Now he's convicted of killing brothel owner Harvey Jones. Just as Carolyn Simpson said, Smith showed no remorse or contrition. She said the murder was premeditated, cold-blooded and deliberate. Jones had become a nuisance to him. It also proves that our legal system does work, even on a 15-year-old murder. 
and more importantly, I suppose, uh, for Harvey Jones, even though he was a scandal, his 80-year-old mum will now have some peace in the final years. Already serving a life sentence for killing a tow truck driver, Smith was eligible for parole within weeks. The Jones verdict finishes that. Nettie was charged with a total of seven murders arising from those prison tapes. Four were dismissed at committal. He was acquitted by a jury for another. And when police won this case, they decided not to proceed with the seventh. There's one conviction, and then we called it quits after that because it was uh, the end result was life, meaning life. He would never walk out of jail uh, vertically. The way in the manner in which the body was found, the place it was found, the bullet wounds that were found on the body, everything supported what Nettie had confessed and we could prove everything that he had said. And to have a jury satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that Nettie had murdered Harvey was just one of the best feelings you get as an investigator. It's not up to police to convict a person. We just put the evidence before the jury and in this case, we'd satisfied the jury that Nettie had killed Harvey. There were high fives all around and congratulations and went out a couple of beers afterwards. It's a good feeling. We'd taken on one of the best in his day from the other side and we'd won. For John Laycock, his fight and search continues. I'd suggest there's uh, at least one set of remains at Port Botany from the 80s uh, with the gang wars and I wouldn't be surprised if there were several more. We haven't given up yet. <laughs>